Hello, everyone, and welcome to this COPE seminar, an introduction to publication ethics and the COPE ethics toolkit. This session has been especially designed to support early career editors and to help journal editors and publishers to prepare their COPE membership application. I'm Trevor Lane, a COPE trustee and council member, and I live in Hong Kong and currently work at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I help produce the COPE Ethics Toolkit along with COPE staff, Linda Goff and Bonnie Jacobs. So I'm happy to explain how to use it in this seminar with my co-host, Siri, who's also a COPE council member and who joins us from Norway. Siri, hi. Hi there. I'm uh, Siri in the summer, and uh, I work as the scientific editor of the Journal of the Norwegian Medical Association. I've been there for the, the past 15 years, and I've been a co-council member for the past two and a half years. And currently, I am a co-chair of the membership subcommittee. Great, thanks. And we'll be hearing more from Siri later. And so Siri and I will be explaining how the COPE Ethics Toolkit can be used to help potential members join COPE, but the toolkit and this webinar should also be useful for current or new members keeping up to date with running an ethical journal office. So in this webinar, I'll introduce the Ethics Toolkit and then go through the COPE core practices and the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. Siri will give some tips on applying for membership, and then we'll have an interactive but anonymous quiz to practice some of the principles. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So first, an introduction to who we are. So COPE, or the Committee on Publication Ethics, is a nonprofit group set up in 1997, and it's run by a small team of paid staff and 30 or so volunteer trustees and council members. And although the group is a UK registered charity, the more than 13,500 members come from 97 countries and are mostly publishers and editors of scholarly journals. But this year, we also opened up membership to universities and research institutes. And there are also some individual and corporate company members, including editorial and publishing support and author support services. Now, it's important to note we don't have legal powers, but our function is to bring together all stakeholders worldwide to discuss, develop and promote best practices in publication ethics. And COPE offers many resources, many of them online, and a regular activity for members is the quarterly online forum to discuss publishing trends and suggest solutions to members' ethics cases. But the more than 600 case summaries are publicly available on the website. Other web source resources are flowcharts to handle cases, guidelines and discussion papers, recordings of COPE speakers and members only meetings. And COPE is a joint founder of the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing that we'll be talking about more later. And for members, we have an e-learning course and a journal audit. The website is publicationethics.org and for social media for this seminar, the hashtag is hashtag C0PE23, not COPE, but hashtag C0PE23. Now COPE's formal mission is promoting integrity in scholarly research and its publication, and we do that by providing practical resources to educate and support our members, providing leadership and thinking on publication ethics, and offering a neutral and unbiased voice in current debates. I've mentioned some of the member benefits already. Now if you look at the last row, you'll see that members also get a customized 
COPE logo that can be verified with COPE. And members can also use template office letters and they can be nominated and elected as council members. Now to become a member, we recommend using the ethics toolkit to check your journal office has clear author and reviewer guidelines and processes for identifying and handling ethical issues. The two main resources we use for guidance are the 10 COPE core practices and the 16 principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. For those in the audience who are already COPE members, you can do a periodic office health check using the COPE journal audit. And for established journal officers that follow COPE guidance but aren't yet members, you can use the principles of transparency as a sort of compliance checklist before membership application. And although the COPE e-learning course is for members only, the introductory module is available for non-members to take. And new journals can make sure they systematically use the toolkit and the relevant COPE core practices to develop clear and ethical author and reviewer guidelines and identify, prevent and handle ethical problems to ensure that the journal follows ethical best practices before applying for COPE membership. The toolkit recommends this approach for setting up an ethical journal office and nurturing a positive publishing culture. So be transparent with all your publication procedures, linking to COPE materials as needed to clearly inform authors, reviewers and readers of the processes of submission, review, publication and also grievances. Comprehensively plan who will do what and how to respond in a timely way to ethical breaches and allegations of misconduct, whether this is done by an ethics team or a dedicated integrity editor, and cooperate with other journals and with other institutions as needed. And be prepared to protect the integrity of the published research record and amend it using COPE guidelines and flowcharts by publishing corrections, retractions, or expressions of concern and seeking legal advice when needed. Now we turn to the two sets of guiding principles behind the toolkit as the basis for setting the guidelines and codes of conduct for your own journal. First, the 10 COPE core practices are the main practices needed to reach the highest standards in publication ethics, and they apply to all stakeholders and COPE members of all categories, including journals, publishers, companies, and institutions. So the core practices are high-level principles that uphold publication integrity. So in alphabetical order, and because they're quite short, I'll go through them all, they are one, allegations of misconduct, Journals should have a clearly described process for handling allegations, however they are brought to the journals or publishers' attention. Journals must take seriously allegations of misconduct pre- and post-publication. Policies should include how to handle allegations from whistleblowers, so those are people reporting potential wrongdoing or malpractice. Two, authorship and contributorship. Clear policies that allow for transparency around who contributed to the work and in what capacity should be in place for requirements for authorship and contributorship, as well as processes for managing potential disputes. Three, complaints and appeals. Journals should have a clearly described process for handling complaints against the journal, its staff, editorial board, or publisher. Four, conflicts of interest or competing interests. There must be clear definitions of conflicts of interest and processes for handling conflicts of interest of authors, reviewers, editors, journals and publishers, whether identified before or after publication. Five, data and reproducibility. Journals should include policies on data availability and encourage the use of reporting guidelines 
and registration of clinical trials and other study designs according to standard practice in their discipline. And six, ethical oversight should include, but is not limited to, policies on consent to publication, publication on vulnerable populations, ethical conduct of research using animals or human subjects, and handling confidential data and ethical business and marketing practices. Seven, intellectual property. All policies on intellectual property, including copyright and publishing licenses, should be clearly described. In addition, any costs associated with publishing should be obvious to authors and readers. Policies should be clear on what counts as pre-publication that will preclude consideration and what constitutes plagiarism and redundant or overlapping publication should be specified. Eight, journal management. A well-described and implemented infrastructure is essential, including the business model, policies, processes, and software for efficient running of an editorially independent journal, as well as the efficient management and training of editorial boards and editorial and publishing staff. Nine, all peer review processes must be transparently described and well-managed. Journals should provide training for editors and reviewers and have policies on diverse aspects of peer review, especially with respect to adoption of appropriate models of review and processes for handling conflicts of interest, appeals and disputes that may arise in peer review. And finally, 10, post-publication discussions and corrections. Journals must allow debate post-publication either on their site through letters to the editor or on an external moderated site such as PubPeer. They must have mechanisms for correcting, revising or retracting articles after publication. As for the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing, these specifically govern how an editorial office produces high quality publications, including special issues, supplements and conference proceedings. And along with COPE, the co-authors of these guidelines are the Directory of Open Access Journals, or DOAJ, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association, or OASPA, and the World Association of Medical Editors, or WAME, or WAMI. And the latest version is version four, published in 2022, last year. So the 16 principles are arranged in areas of publication management. So that's journal content, journal practices, the organization managing the journal and business practices. So I won't go through everything, but I've shown in yellow the additions that are in the latest version. So these show that the publishers and editors are responsible for promoting accessibility, diversity, equity and inclusivity in all aspects of the publication and editorial decisions should be based on scholarly merit. And it goes on to say that journals should regularly assess their policies for inclusivity. So I'd say here that I've noticed a common problem with journals calling themselves international, but it's clear that the editors, reviewers, and authors are all from only one country. So beware of your journal name or guidelines claim the journal is international. So first, a journal's name should be unique and not be misleading. And here's a COPE member journal from Armenia, as an example, called Wisdom, which is quite apt given the owl mascot we've been using for the COPE seminar series this year. Websites should be secure and use the HTTPS in the web address and the website content should not be misleading or plagiarized. There should be clear aims and scope statements and authorship criteria and separate ISSNs or international standard serial numbers for the print and electronic versions. So you'll also notice from the examples that some of the information required in the criteria uh, would be spread out in different places in the website or the web page. The publishing frequency should be clear and true, and there 
should be a permanent online archive of the journal's articles, such as in PMC, LOCKS, CLOCKS, Portico, or PKP Preservation Network. Who owns the copyright should be clear, and the website and journal copyright notices should be separate, such as in this example from a Wiley journal that's owned by a professional society and university. A technical but important point is to show copyright and open access license, such as Creative Commons license, in both the PDF version and the HTML version of the article. Principle seven is all to do with publication ethics, and you'll notice it refers to eight out of the 10 COPE core practices, showing that the 16 principles of transparency and the 10 COPE core practices complement each other. And the other two COPE core practices are actually in the other principles of transparency. So COPE members can show their COPE member logo while explaining that their ethics policies are based on COPE's guidelines. And both COPE members and non-members can link to COPE's resources, such as flowcharts, for dealing with suspected ethical breaches. Principle eight is on peer review, and that's about the clarity of the process, including in the yellow, the new requirements on saying who conducts review and if author recommended reviewers are allowed or not, and if individuals are anonymized, and if peer review reports are published with or without reviewer names. So current COPE members or reapplicants should update their guidelines according to the yellow highlighted information in these latest principles of transparency. Don't use the old version. Some more new requirements on peer review include stating the decision-making process and clarifying exceptions to the regular peer review process, such as which article types don't get peer reviewed. So in this example from Nature Reviews Materials, it says viewpoint articles aren't peer reviewed, and it depends for correspondence articles. And also, a new requirement is to give the publication date in the article, preferably also with the dates of manuscript receipt and acceptance. Journals need to clearly say how readers can access articles and what the fees are and whether it's available in electronic copy or also print copy. Number 10 is about journal ownership and management. So this must be clear, ideally with uh, relevant web links on the website. And to not look like a fake or predatory journal, the editorial board needs to be real with names and affiliations. And it's best to constantly keep the editorial board up to date and to also have clear journal contact details. And please keep COPE informed of the personnel team changes, especially if the chief editor changes. Author fees and any waivers must be transparent and independent of editorial decisions. And all revenue sources such as supplements and also read and publish deals should be stated in the guidelines and in articles, and again, mustn't influence editorial decisions. Finally, journals should state if they accept advertising and under what conditions, and any emailing campaigns should be done professionally and honestly. Now, COPE journal and publisher members need to follow both the 10 COPE core practices 
which deal with general publishing ethics and the 16 principles of transparency, which focus on technical and logistic aspects of peer reviewed publications. And as we've seen, both sets of principles are harmonized with each other. So next, we'll spend about 10 minutes giving some guidance on applying for COPE membership. And I was, um, I've been on COPE Council for seven years now, and I was in the membership subcommittee in my first term on council. And Siri, you're now the co-chair of that subcommittee. So you have first-hand experience of processing and uh, assessing applications. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So how uh, you'll be the best person to tell us how the COPE core practices are relevant to planning and running a journal office. Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, remember those four key activities for a successful editorial office highlighted in the ethics toolkit. The first about educating authors and reviewers, and the third more proactive one, to develop processes to help identify ethical concerns. And the fourth one, develop guidelines for responding to ethical breaches. And then to your question, Trevor, all of those four key activities are aligned with COPE uh, core practices, as you can see on the right of the screen. So for example, develop guidelines for authors is aligned with core practice number two, authorship and contributorship. Guidelines for reviewers with core practice number nine, peer review process, and so on. Uh, and as you may notice, number three and four is slightly overlapping. For example, core practice number 10 is relevant for both three and four. So, first publication discussions may help spot ethical concerns, whereas a, a retraction may be a response to an ethical breach. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, want to highlight that both the toolkit and COPE core practices are meta guidelines rather than guidelines, which means that they are not rule books, but meant as a help to create your own guidelines for your journal in your discipline. And you will find a lot of uh, useful resources connected to each of the 10 core practices um, on COPE's website. Oh, so that's very useful, Siri. So um, journals can't just copy and paste the COPE core practice and say that's our rule and we follow it. So it's not as simple as that. No, you have to adapt everything for your journal. Mm. So how are journal offices actually meant to customize and translate the COPE resources into practical guidelines and policies and processes mm -hmm. for their own journal? So for example, number two was about peer review. Yeah, so let's let's do that example. Say you are to develop guidelines for reviewers for your journal, uh, then you would probably look at core practice number nine and relevant resources on the website about transparent review processes and so on. And then you can go to the toolkit, which has a list of uh, suggestions on what to include. So in more detail, you would state on your website what is what content is peer reviewed, what model of peer review you use, for example, single blind, double blind, open peer review, and how the peer review process is managed and by whom. And then you should consider including how peer reviewers are selected and trained, how many peer reviewers per manuscript, reviewers responsibilities and the ethics of reviewing, including conflicts of interest and policies on confidentiality of the process. And then uh, more practical ones, how to perform a review and time allowed, what reviewers should do if they suspect misconduct, how to, re uh, to, how to prepare the report and how decisions are made in your journal. And then you should also consider having, or you should have procedures for review of submitted revisions and how you handle appeals. Okay, that's a very uh, useful syllabus. 
Um, but then how does that lead to the actual resources? All right, so, so the items presented serve as like a useful checklist and for each item you have to, to make your own guidelines and policies appropriate for your journal, as I mentioned. Uh, and you'll find a lot of relevant resources on the website um, and for uh, the review process, two central ones are the ethical guidelines for peer reviewers and also uh, the editing peer review guideline. And uh, you will find a lot of cases relevant for, for the peer review process and also, of course, the flowcharts which are really useful step-by-step -step guide on how to, how to manage the issues that arise. So, yeah. I think looking at the list, we can see there's different types of resources. I mentioned this earlier too. So there's actual guidelines, which are a little bit like rules that everyone's agreed on within the industry, within the publishing community. So those are a bit more clear cut, but mm -hmm. for new issues and emerging issues, for example, the who who owns the peer reviews, that's a discussion document. So it really is a discussion because it's too new to create any rules or maybe it's, it's too variable. So um, all the factors and variables and issues are laid out for people to look at and decide on their own to formulate their own policy for now, but at least be aware of uh, trends and emerging issues. Right. And uh, who can actually apply for membership? So there are there are two main categories. So you have the journal members and the publisher members. And if you are applying for one to four journals, uh, you should apply as a journal member for each of the journals. And each of the journals should have published for at least one year before applying. However, with more than five five or more journals from the same publisher, you should, uh, or you must apply for publisher membership. Um, in addition to these two, we have individual and corporate membership, essentially for individuals and companies that are not editors, journals and publishers, but who are interested in publication ethics and are working in or associated with the publication of peer reviewed scholarly journals. And we also have to mention um, the new membership category for universities and research institutes who, who conduct and publish research. And I think um, uh, application for membership is going to, to open quite soon. I'm not sure about the exact, exact time, but as soon it will be opened. Yeah, it's opened um, for limited um selected institutions this year and then it will yeah. be open next year so yeah for the extra members individuals companies and institutions so there are separate procedures on the website so um the toolkit is basically for these two types of members yeah. and how do they apply well uh there are different application forms for the different uh, membership categories so First thing is to ensure that you select the, rec uh, the correct form. Uh, and as I said, if you're applying for between one and four journals, you should apply as a journal member for each, each journal. And we strongly recommend you read through the frequently asked questions uh, on membership, and also that you review the application form before applying to enable to gather all the information you need to complete your application. So for example, we ask individual journal applicants to provide email addresses for eight editorial members, editorial board members, and uh, as part of our assessment process, we will contact members of your editorial board. And you will also need to provide the current CV for your general editor in chief. So the form, so if you go one, one uh, slide back, uh, Trevor. So um, please note that the form requires website links to key policies and guidelines, and that we would like you to provide discrete links to, to the specific uh, policy and guideline and not just the same uh, link for 
for every policy. So not just linked to, to the front page, for example. Mm -hmm. As for um, the publisher application forms, they look a little bit different. So here you must provide a spreadsheet with details of, of the journals that you submit. And um, as part of our assessment process here, we will contact a random sample of your journal editors. And also here you, you'd like to, to provide a discrete link to policies and guidelines, of course. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's a good idea to read through the membership application FAQs. You will find some really useful information there, I think. Okay. And how much does it cost? Hmm. Yeah, the fee vary between membership types and also within membership types. So for individual journals, the fee depends on the number of issues per year. Um, so if you have uh, below 12 issues per year, it's about 180 pounds. Uh, if you have more than 12 issues per year, it's uh, just above 400 pounds. As for publishers, the fee depends on the number of journals submitted, and you will find all the rates on, on the website. And we well, see there's um, waivers available or reduced fees available. Yeah, that's right. So, of course, we have waivers. Uh, you may request a free membership or reduced membership fees according to certain criteria, and you will find them all uh, at the website link. Okay. And then how are applications actually assessed? Yeah, so uh, if the application form is complete, it goes to the membership administrator who will do an initial check, a first check of your application and website. And at this stage, we will contact the editorial board members listed in your application, and we will look for at least 50% responses. Actually, above 60% of applications are rejected at this first triage stage. Um, and I guess largely because of overall problems with quality and policies and also lack of responses from, from editorial board members. Okay, and if you pass this first uh, stage, uh, your application will be passed um, uh, to the membership subcommittee and reviewed in more depth by one or more members of council. At this stage, we will go into more detail based on the principles of transparency and core practices, and we will check a sample of papers to assess whether described policies are set into practice. And my experience is that one common reason for rejection at this stage is that stated policies are not reflected in the actual articles. Um, so that's worth. Uh, oh, so you actually you actually search for the um, sample articles of the journal to check that the core practices and the principles of transparency are yeah. being used. So say if you state on your website that you will um, uh, you will ask the authors for COIs, conflicts of interest, and then if the papers there's no evidence of, of the COI declaration in the paper so there's like a discrepancy between your policy and the paper so that's one of the things we will we will check yeah um about so some some numbers uh, about half of the applications that are passed to the subcommittee uh are accepted so uh at the moment, we have a total acceptance rate, about 20%. Okay. And actually, there's a question in the question box that says, um, how do uh, applicants prepare the documents? Do they just list the core practices and describe the core practices? I don't think that's right. No, no. So I think you will... Um, so the important thing is to read the core practices and the relevant resources uh, before you fill, fill in your application. 
So, so the major point here is to to use them to make your own own guidelines. Yes. Okay. So it's more like a background information for you to use. And how long does the application process take? Well, uh, I think at the moment we are about seven months. So it's quite long. Okay. Okay. So it's it's a process that we take very seriously. We right. we do really sort of the assessments of your application. It, oh. it must take time because you're you're saying you actually test the editorial board list by emailing them and seeing if they mm -hmm. reply to see if they're yeah. real. Yes. And if you get rejected, can you reapply straight away? No, you have to wait for 12 months. And that's just because we would like you to give you some time to to uh, to get the policies uh, right and to, to set them into practice. OK. Mm. OK, so good luck to everyone. There's some um, useful advice there. And uh, final tips for applying. Yeah, so we have the do's and don'ts. Uh, so follow the instructions in the toolkit and ensure yeah, your application is complete because only complete applications will be assessed. And then, as we mentioned earlier, provide discrete URLs uh, and also check that they are functional, actually. Okay. Don't, don't uh, copy and paste code for other resources as if they were your own guidelines. And also, don't use the same URL or homepage URL for each required guideline. Yes, I remember when I looked at applications, that was uh, a common problem. The same homepage appeared on every um, <laughs> box, but that can't be right because how can all the um, ethical guidelines be on the homepage? Okay, thank you, Siri. And um, I think those are some useful tips. Basically, it's a lot of homework to create your own guidelines. Um, but at least all the major uh, important factors are listed in the principles of practice and the core practices. I think now it's time to try out and test the audience's um, ability to apply the core practices. I know we've just presented them to you in this seminar. Uh, hopefully um, you're familiar with them anyway. So let's look at some interactive case studies. These are real COPE forum cases. And for this part, there will be an anonymous poll window that will pop up and hopefully we'll get this to work. And uh, so answer out of A, B and C uh, in the poll window. So don't type in the chat box, don't type in the Q and A box. And then Siri will ask the questions and summarize the responses and then I'll comment on the relevant applicable COPE resources. So here's the first case about an editor. Actually, this came up in the question box. Um, so an editor authoring their own paper in their own journal. So go ahead, Siri. Yeah, so this is the most fun part, I think, of the session. Uh, so uh, the editor of a specialist journal is a leading researcher in a certain topic and he wants to publish his or their work and their own uh, journal is the only one suitable worldwide. The editor would have uh, certainly a conflict of interest submitting to his own journal and personally selecting two external peer reviewers. So the question here is, can editors publish in their own journal? And we'll go through the, the three alternatives. So the first one is, no, they can't. Peer review will be biased because of a conflict of interest. Alternative B, yes, they can, but an associate editor should independently handle the peer review process. And C, yes, but remove all the names before peer review. So you're to, so we'll open the poll now and, and you are to vote for one of the three alternatives. Okay, so. I guess we will end the poll there and hopefully everyone will be able to see the results. So we have uh, 79, uh, so we have 103 votes altogether and 77% of them goes to alternative B. What do you say about that, Trevor? Ah, so B wins and then 15% uh, 
chose A, and then a few fewer nine percent chose C. Um, now A is a bit strict, and people did choose A, and I do have seen some journals which forbid it and say that chief editors editorial board cannot publish in their own journal. So journals can set their own policy if they are they can be very strict. Um, so the argument there would be because it's a conflict of interest and it would be biased. But then you can see the other side that if it's a new journal or it's a journal that specifically chose a chief editor for their knowledge in a specialty area, and maybe the journal is a special one that's a new area, new topic, or a interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary journal, then the editorial board would be the best people in that area, but then you're depriving them of publishing in their own field. So we can see arguments for both sides. Um, also, maybe there's the restaurant owner argument. If you want to, if you're in a new city and you want to try a new restaurant, you'd want to see if the restaurant owner eats in their own restaurant. <laughs> Otherwise, that will be say, say something about the quality of the food. Um, but then you don't want to see 75% of papers by the same editorial board. So pros and cons. And uh, if, you, if journals choose to allow editorial board and editors to publish, then of course, there have to be transparent guidelines. The conflict of interest can be minimized. It might not be removed completely. And maybe you can do that by B. So using an independent reviewer from the um, editorial board or maybe an external guest editor. And to declare this as well in the article, remember one of the principles of transparency was to declare if there were exceptions and also make it as a policy, whether you allow editors on to publish or not, but then set the guidelines and set the policy and make it transparent. So C, some people chose, uh, might work, but in this case, it's the same, it's the chief editor doing the peer review process. So on its own, just removing the names won't work because the chief editor would be choosing the peer reviewers as well. But maybe in combination with B, C might work. But then there's the argument that if it's a small specialty area, everyone knows everyone anyway, so they could guess who the author is. But let's have a look at um, the relevant guidelines. So no clear cut answers. Maybe B is the best one. But as you see in these cases, it's not usually clear cut. So as I said, the principles of transparency number eight said if an article's peer review is an exception to the usual policy, the article should state what review it did receive. And there is a useful cope guideline called a short guide to ethical editing for new editors. So if you're a early career editor, or you want to revise and uh, update yourself, you can check these guidelines. Number nine in the guidelines says, can editors publish in their own journal? It says, while you should not be denied the ability to publish in your own journal, you must take extra precautions not to exploit your position or to create an impression of impropriety, so um, dishonesty or unfairness. Your journal must have a procedure for handling submissions from editors or members of the editorial board that will ensure that the peer review is handled independently of the author editor. We also recommend that you describe the process in a commentary or similar note once the paper is published. And actually the link is to the forum case that we just looked at. So all useful information here and an example from a Taylor and Francis website of its guidelines, um, abstain from the peer review process and editorial decisions for any papers authored by the editor or where they have a competing interest. So not only if the editor is an author, but if they have a COI uh, conflict of interest in one of the papers. In such instances, the editor must delegate responsibility of the peer review and the editorial decision process of any of their own work submitted to the journal, excluding editorials, of course, to another suitable editor. And then in a Wiley journal, 
there's an example where one of the authors is on the editorial board and they state it in a footnote um, that this author is an assistant editor for the journal, but did not participate in the peer review process other than as an author, and the authors declare no other conflicts of interest. So this I noticed when I was on the um, membership subcommittee, this was missing a lot in uh, journal policies. So uh, what, they, what they do if the editor or editorial board authors a paper. Okay, so number two, yeah, so just just a quick comment before we move on. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to highlight one of one of the points that you made um, that it's uh, it will be almost impossible to remove bias completely. I think uh, so. If your journal allows editors to submit to to uh, their own journal, you must be. I think the most important thing is to be transparent about the process and to make sure. Uh, to minimize the bias. So it's more about minimizing bias than to remove it. Uh, sure. We have tried different models for this in my journal and, and we always see that it's it's almost impossible to, to remove bias completely. So just a quick point there. That's a good point. But, and I think that's why it's useful to have that statement in the paper as well for the reader to know. For transparency, that's good, yeah. So, okay, so we have our second case. Uh, which is about duplicate publication. It's a medical one, but it could be uh, essentially anything. <laughs> so we have an article A about a medical treatment that is published by four authors in journal A, but it's found to be similar to article B, published two years earlier in journal B by two of the four authors plus another. Most of the abstract methods and discussion are identical, and Article B has four more patients in the sample. Uh, article A, so the latest article, Article A, has the same reference as the first article, Article B, plus six, six extra references, uh, including one to Article B. So the latest article referenced the first article. The question here is, is it duplicate publication when the first article, Article A, uh, no, sorry, when uh, the first article, Article B, is referenced in the second article, which is Article A. We have three alternatives again. Uh, first one is, no, it's not duplicate publication. The author groups of the two articles are different. B. No, it's not. Referencing is enough for transparency. C, yes, it's duplicate. This is republishing a major part of the study. So we'll open the poll again and would like to, to see your votes. Okay. So I think we probably will end the poll there and have a look at the results. So now we have 92 votes and uh, 78 uh, for alternative C. And there's also uh, 11 votes for alternative B. So do you agree with the with the audience, Trevor? Is, is C the right option here? Oh, okay. So 85% chose C. Um, Let's see, because we said it's not always clear cut. So is A or B possible? Mm -hmm. um, now, I think A is a clear no-no because if we reverse it, I know it's a bit confusing sometimes these cases. So article A seems to be overlapping with the earlier one B and so B had three authors, and then A now suddenly has four authors. So it removed one of the authors from B and then added two new authors, and at the same time um, removed four patients. So that's a very suspicious um, event. Uh, so the content is mostly the same, but 
the authors are different. Uh, why, why do you need two extra authors and remove one of the authors for reanalyzing the data after omitting four patients? And that sounds like it's trying to beautify the data a bit to removing um, samples. So as you said, it doesn't have to be medical, um, a medical article. So if you change the samples and then you suddenly republish something, uh, so it's a bit suspicious. It suggests data manipulation and also author misattribution. So let's look at B. So B is possible because if they declared in the main text what exactly were the differences between the two overlapping papers, then that should be transparent enough if it's not suspicious, like um, as in A, that you're deleting um, data from patients. So if it's... Uh, justifiable if it's if there's a true and honest reason and also if if it is for uh, human participant um, studies if you pre-registered and predicted that you would be doing uh, a post hoc or sub analysis so if you planned this in your design so then it's also a, a possible situation where it's allowed so b is not um, completely banned but at the same time, if you have um, overlapping material, many journals now ask authors to submit it and declare it at the time of submission. And then the chief editor can decide how much overlap there is. Are you trying to do salami publishing, salami slicing, and trying to cut up one study into many different studies? So B is possible, but under the right conditions, but also declare it at the time of submission. And C, I think, is the best answer here. So the 85% um, I'd agree with, uh, because republishing most of a paper again distorts the literature, especially for uh, medical clinical uh, devices. Um, it looks like there's two or more studies independently showing something works, but actually it's the same uh, data and it will distort the answers and future meta-analyses for people trying to find out the um, overall answer when they pull the data from many studies. So if they're not alerted that there's possibly overlapping papers and they count the paper twice, then that's going to be dangerous for uh, the public, for um, patients in the future. So in this case, uh, they might have to retract the paper and uh, investigate more. And let's have a look at the relevant COPE advice. So actually there is a flowchart, suspected redundant publication in a published article. And the relevant part, it says, um, if there's major overlap or redundancy, i.e. based on the same data set with identical findings or evidence that the authors have sought to hide the redundancy, for example, by changing the title or author order, or not referring to the previous paper, then we follow all the way down and it could end up as um, retracting a paper. So you inform the editor of the other journal involved, consider publishing a retraction or statement of redundant publication if the other journal agrees to retract and consider informing the institution or the person responsible for research governance. So this is misconduct, but the uh, redundancy has to be addressed. So I've checked the, what happens. The practice varies a bit, but the COPE guidance actually for COPE core practice seven, so what constitutes plagiarism and redundant overlap in publication should be specified. And this is one of the cases for retraction. So the retraction guidelines say that if redundant publication occurs, the journal that published first may issue a notice of redundant publication. So the first journal doesn't retract. And uh, unless there's other concerns such as reliability of the data, any journals that subsequently publish a redundant article that's a repeat of the first one should retract it and state the reason for retraction. So this is a, a special case where the later um, paper, so article A should be retracted, and then article B, the journal should issue a notice of redundant publication. And
And here's an example from nature. So copies of papers containing related work that are under consideration or in press at other journals should be included with the submission as additional supplementary information. So authors need to, for some journals, authors need to declare overlapping material at the start. And in this case, it says that preprints don't count as um, pre-publication. So we can go to number three now. Yeah, so just uh, just a quick comment again, uh, Trevor. So you mentioned, I think, um, uh, that authors should, uh, should declare in the cover letter to the editor whether there is any uh, duplicate data. Um, and I guess it's a good rule also to to declare uh, if the editor says okay it's it's okay. Um, also to declare it in the actual uh, article what's new and what's uh, already published so that the reader uh, can can uh, figure it out. And also for the meta analysis, of course, as you mentioned. So a typical example from my journal, uh, which is a um, national journal. Uh, would be a global multi-center study where the main results are published already uh, internationally, but the authors, Norwegian authors, want to present the national data in more detail in our national journal. So uh, I guess the key again is transparency uh, in both in, in the cover letter and in, in the actual article. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so we'll go, go forward. Move forward. Uh, so uh, the third case is about lack of participant consent. A journal receives the submitted manuscript reporting on a volunteer receiving experimental hospital treatment that was given under supervision in an intensive care unit in case of serious side effects. And the journal submission does not mention participant giving informed consent or researchers obtaining ethics committee approval. So, what should the editor do next? Um, so, alternative A proceed with peer review because this was emergency care. B ask the authors about informed consent and ethics committee approval. And C suspend review and ask the author's institution to follow up. So we'll open uh, open the poll again and welcome your uh, votes. Uh, Trevor, mm. what would your comment? Okay. So that's 89% chose B, 9% uh, just did choose C and 2% chose A. Let's have a look. Um, so A, the fewest people chose, and I think A is not a good answer here just because it's emergency care. Uh, now it's, it's rare only in life-threatening um, situations where you can't ask for consent, but the researchers don't decide what is, um, what, uses what needs consent and what doesn't need consent so and in this case it did say volunteer um, a volunteer receiving experimental treatment so if this was experimental research and it's clearly a volunteer that should have given consent or signed something after having been explained the uh, benefits and risks and that they can withdraw at any time things like that so whether something needs consent or not uh, still has to be addressed uh, and it doesn't depend just on the type of study or um, study design so sometimes um, authors don't get consent for observational research or some social science survey research things like that but actually um, to be safe the ethics committee needs to give that permission of a waiver of participant consent. So A is not a good reply. B um, is following COPE guidance, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. So ask the authors first. And C, 
some people chose and um usually the cope guidance is to to go for b and then c so if there's an unsatisfactory response if you do ask the authors maybe they did make a mistake and forgot to include it but you always give the benefit of the doubt to begin with so let's have a look so the relevant guidance is a flowchart dealing with suspected ethics issues in a submitted manuscript and the relevant bit is to request the author to supply the details if there's things missing like uh, institutional review board irb approval or copy of informed consent documents and then if it's an an unsatisfactory response then you go to the author's institution and you suspend the peer review so this brings us to the toolkit that remember um item number three was to identify and prevent ethical concerns and ethical oversight so research ethics is part of that and that's core practice number six policies on consent to publication and research using human subjects and the syllabus or the list of useful things to include in your guidelines are that journals must diligently review submitted work to ensure that it conforms with research ethics and recommended practices for handling issues such as informed consent, institutional oversight, prior ethics approval and compliance with international research guidelines. There's many other things there. We see plagiarism, falsification, fabrication, citation manipulation, peer review manipulation, author misconduct, so this is part of the toolkit and the thing that we've mentioned a lot in our guidance and in the toolkit is ICMJE, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Again, it doesn't have to be a medical journal to follow them, but they have very comprehensive guidelines about protection of research participants. And an example in an Elsevier journal, Journal of Emergency Nursing, the guidelines do talk about appropriate consent, permission and releases, and that the Institutional Review Board IRB permission letter has to be submitted also at the time of submission. And here it's reminded me to mention there's three types of participant consent, uh, including patient consent that you need to get um, for um, publication. So the first, of course, is consent to the treatment and taking part in the study. The second is consent to publishing the case or publishing data to do with the participant or patient. And the third, which many people miss, is the consent to share data publicly. So many journals now uh, encourage or require you to share the raw data anonymized with identifiers taken out, but actually you, you need the participant consent for that. So make sure you get three types of consent. And then in that journal, Journal of Emergency Nursing, there's actually an ethics declaration in the article at the end, which says ethical approval for this project was granted by blah, 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 with an approval number. So that's just an example of declaring it in the paper as well. Okay, so that leads us to number four. Yeah, so this is the last case. It's about an authorship uh, dispute, which we see quite often. Uh, so we have a retired professor claiming that he or they should have been included as an author on two published articles in the journal. The editor discovered that the professor was involved uh, in the early stage of both studies and was actually named as an author, but removed from the final draft by a co-author. And after much effort and also involvement of the institution, the editor decided to correct both articles by adding the author but uh, neither authors were uh, happy about it, that they were still unhappy. And the question here is how can the editor handle future author disputes? Alternatives are A, uh, ask authors to declare contributions so editor can decide, B, retract the affected articles, or C, require authors or their institution to decide. So we'll go to the poll now.
Okay, so I think it will be okay to end the poll now and to see the results. Uh, so now we have 90 votes and it's um, uh, most people voted for alternative A, 62%, uh, and 30% for alternative C. And there was also a few uh, voting alternative B. So I would like to know what you think about, about this, Trevor. Mm, so about two thirds chose A and the third chose C, but also some were quite strict and went straight to retract. Um, now, I think the case here is that, or the point here is that the editor tried to do everything on their own and they did involve the provost of the institution at the end. But I think it took a lot of time because they were trying to be the peacekeeper or the mediator and trying to, and or the also FBI trying to find out what was happening. Um, so the COPE guidance is always that the journals can't find out and settle author disputes, find out who was the true author. So the authors have to decide and do it themselves or involve the institution. But actually, so A might not look right, but I think it is possible for the editor to take an active role in deciding who is the author if there are clear criteria and guidelines in place. And then the policy is that the authors have to declare something anyway. So if they declare all the contributions, hopefully we can trust them. So they also declare uh, no authors were missed out. All the authors who should be authors are included. People who should be acknowledged are acknowledged. So if everything is stated and there's still a dispute, then it should be easy for the editor to match up who did what and then to match that against the criteria of the journal. So there might be some misunderstanding because different journals have different authorship criteria. But if everything is listed out, then the editor could arbitrate and uh, say, no, you haven't done enough because that's just an acknowledgement. For example, you just secured funding. So A is possible if all the guidelines are clear, the criteria are clear, and the authorship contribution statement is clear. B is a bit harsh, but actually it's possible uh, if the author uh, the missing author's data was stolen, so it becomes an intellectual property uh, matter. Uh, usually we say don't retract because of an author dispute if the content is believable, is credible, and it's just something like the order of the authors or um, a missing author, but it's easily corrected and they all agree. So uh, we use the Re uh, relevant COPE flowchart, but if it becomes more complicated and actually misconduct, then yes, it could be uh, a legal matter. Or if further investigation leads to suspicion that there's more going on, and if the author list isn't right, then what else isn't right? And is the whole paper uh, problematic? Or even the worst case, uh, a paper mill paper. So it was, it was a questionable paper. The authors weren't true authors. A paper mill um, must produced a fake paper. So it, it could get quite complicated. So again, not that clear cut. So C though is the most common um, situation and we use COPE flowcharts. So we require the authors or the institution to decide. And this one is to request to add an author after publication. And we see that we ask the uh, authors to explain, but if, again, it's an unsatisfactory answer, it would have to go to the institution to decide, and then the institution makes a ruling. I've actually seen some guidelines of universities, not at the publication stage, but at the submission stage. So if there's a authorship dispute at a sub for a submitted paper and it gets taken to the university um, dean or person in charge of research 
and they could adjudicate. And actually it said, if the authors can't decide, then the institution has to demand that the authors take the paper away. They can't publish the paper. So that's quite a pragmatic solution. Um, and here I'll talk about the toolkit, which had uh, area number one, the author guidelines. So we did say it depends on COPE core practice number two, have to be clear who contributed to the work and in what capacity and uh, process for managing potential disputes, i.e. take it back to the institution. And the syllabus list includes a clear definition of authorship, how author contributions should be declared in the submission and also maybe in the publication itself and how potential authorship disputes are managed. And an example here from an OUP journal um, co-published with Giga Science that uh, they list out the ICMJE criteria. We, st we just saw those, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, the four criteria. And then in the paper itself, they list who did what in a traditional way, linking to those four criteria. And an example of a taxonomy is the credit or contributor roles taxonomy with 14 items of contributions of uh, people taking part in producing the paper and its research. But it's not enough just to itemize these. Um, but I said before, if you list them, it's easier for the journal to adjudicate. So if the authors had listed them, then the journal will compare that against their own list. So here's an example from Sage uh, journals that it mirrors the ICMJE, but it uses the credit taxonomy and it highlights which items do uh, allow the authors to be called authors. So at least one of those four, and then at least one of the writing original draft or writing review and editing. So they're quite clear in defining the criteria using the credit items. So in this case, the editor could have adjudicated. And an example of a credit style authorship declaration is here. So it uses those um, terms from that dictionary we just saw. And in the guidelines of SAGE, for the author guidelines, again, it says authorship of the paper has to be accurately rep represented, including ensuring that all individuals credited as authors participated in the actual authorship. And then here, it also says authors have to be transparent and declare possibly duplicate publication. So this um, reminds us of the other case. So if you have clear author guidelines, that does help prevent uh, problems in the future. And finally, um, I wanted to add that, as Siri said, it's not really just rules, a rule book that you follow. Things do emerge and evolve. So even for authorship, COPE put out a position statement recently about generative AI, saying that um, authors have to be humans and AI tools cannot be one of the authors and you have to declare what type of um, generative AI you used. So that leads us to the end and of the cases and the main part of the webinar, but we hope you found it useful and there is still time for questions. So please type any remaining questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those. And I'll ask, there was one question on membership um, series, so maybe you can answer that. So membership is only for journals or does it include books and conference proceedings? Okay, so as far as I know, we don't include uh, books, conference proceedings uh, yet, but I think there's a working group on that. Isn't that right, Trevor? So so we have uh, membership for journals and um, publishers and also the individual and corporate membership and universities and research institutes. But as far as I know, uh, book conference proceedings is not yeah. included yet. Yeah, not yet, yes. Mm -hmm. I guess this one may be for you, uh, Trevor. So uh, 
there's a comment here that this require authors of their institutions uh, going back to square one. Is that on? It's probably the one of the cases, right? Yeah, if this is to do About with case publishing. four, yeah. So if if the auth if the journal requires the author to settle it themselves with the institution, so I, I assume square one means back to basics, back to the data. Yeah. So the yeah. institution will have to go back to the, the raw data, who did what, lab books, um, notes and things like that to prove who did what and they will have to so yes it can get quite messy and use a lot of time but um the institution will have to do that um investigation and then as i said if it goes all the way to misconduct then that becomes another um type of investigation mm -hmm. uh, but yes it will have to go back to square one only the institution keeps those records so hopefully um, they will have uh, uh, they will have kept those records. So it depends. It varies between institutions. Um, I've seen five years, seven years, ten years. So um, yeah, it, the responsibility goes back to the institutions. Mm -hmm. And there's also a question uh, whether or not the ICMJ e authorship guidelines. Uh, are clear. They're clear and it's for, um, they're quite, they're generic but also discipline specific that um, to, for the responsibility for publishing health information that's quite important so we have to know who wrote the paper who wrote the guidelines so that's quite strict saying that the authors have to have written it as well there are alternative uh, criteria also for other journals and other disciplines so arts humanities social sciences the writing is part of the thinking process itself so uh, some journals might also say that the writing is important but maybe there's other disciplines that there's a team effort and it's difficult to know to, to have everybody write something but it's actually a bigger team and a multidisciplinary effort so there are guidelines the based on the pnas proceedings of the national academies of sciences which puts writing the paper and drafting and re revising the paper as an alternative to conceptualizing, uh, collecting data, analyzing, interpreting. And uh, so, yeah, in that case, the you don't have to have, you don't need to have written anything to be an author. So it really depends on the, what criteria are used and uh, what discipline it is, what the tradition is. So yeah, ICMJE is clear, but that's, that's not the point, whether it's clear or not. Um, different disciplines will have different traditions. Right. Um, another one, um, is there a good resource to differentiate between uh, conflicts of interest versus ethical practices in COPE? Um, I think that's asking, it, do we have guidance on what is conflict of interest? Because that's one of the co core practices, isn't it? Yeah. So right. I think there is um, there is a general document on COIs, and we also um, encourage use of clear declarations. And I know ICMJE has a generic COI declaration form so that's something that's important to fill in and hand hand in at submission so yeah. practices like that we would definitely endorse and here's um an interesting one so it's an anon anonymous attendee uh, who writes uh we have had an author request that we change the publication date to a month before the paper was published online. As they have stated, the month it is published is uh, in its uses to them. They are threatening not to pay the APC charges 
we would not change the date, but should the institution be informed? So they're asking for an earlier date of publication. Yeah. Maybe it's to meet a uh, um, uh, promotion application or something. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that kind of goes against what we just said about yeah. being transparent and truthful about the submission date, revision date, acceptance date, publication date. So um, I think um, the answer would be, well, this would be a good case for COPE Forum. Um, so COPE Forum would uh, discuss something like this and um, give advice at the end probably saying, uh, no, you shouldn't change the date. And yes, you should inform the institution, especially if they're trying to cheat to have an earlier date to make a promotion deadline. So that would be um, uh, misconduct for both the journal and the institution. So yeah, if, if in doubt and you think it's a misconduct case, then take it back to the institution. It's for them to decide and they can do their own assessment and investigation. I have I saw a question for you, Siri. Um, is COPE membership for journals? Is it only for English journals? And I, I did see something in the FAQ that it is only for English journals for now. Yeah, so I guess we don't have the resources to assess non-English journals uh, for now, but it's under under review. Oh, here's one for you. Um, I'm not sure if it's relevant to the topic. That's fine, you can ask. So uh, the person's wondering if it's ethical for a reviewer and or an assistant editor to recommend citation of their own work. Okay. What do you do in those cases? Yeah, so, um, uh, so the thing here is, I mean, if it's, uh, relevant and essential uh, references that the authors have omitted. Uh, I, I guess you could do that, but uh, or <laughs> just to like a limited extent, you don't want to overdo that. Isn't that right, Trevor? Yeah, I think it's if it's justified and it's yeah. uh, and the chief editor um, or the reviewer, they can see it's the it is just it is missing one important citation, a historic one, or one that they've missed out and they've been cherry picking. If they've been um, the authors have been citing one side of the argument but not the other, so they give an example that of the other side, and it happens to be their own work. So I think if it's just the odd one. Um, it's and it's justifiable and part of the academic argument, but of course it's suspicious if you have a list of ten citations and then you get weird demands as well, saying you must cite half of these for me to accept your paper. Of course, that's not right. That's not right, and that's actually one of the things we look uh, for when we assess applications in the membership committee. Um, so we look for cita citation manipulation. Uh, so is there like a lot of references uh, uh, to the author's own work or uh, to the journal they are publishing in? Uh, that's a sign of uh, manipulation. So that's one of the things we look for. Yeah, I think that's why it must take seven months or longer. So you're doing a bit of an FBI or CSI to look at sample papers. If, is there author, is there citation manipulation? Um, are all the papers written by the editorial board? Yeah. Yeah, and also I think uh, our administrator, before it comes to the subcommittee, um, spends quite a lot of time to to gather all the information that's needed to to assess the application so that's also some of the time consuming part of it of the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay uh, so there's a question here have you heard of white hunting 
I'm white afraid I have fonting. <laughs> so white fonting, I think, is um, something used by websites um, for similar to keyword stuffing. So it's part of search engine optimization that because it's in the metadata or it can be picked up but not seen because they put it as white font and it's hidden text. So either, of course, the message and the text itself could be misinformation or disinformation, mm -hmm. but basically I've, I've heard of it as keyword stuffing, that there's lots of keywords put there so that the search engine will pick up and it would go higher in the results page, but it's not seen, um, it's not visible. So that's one way to stuff keywords onto a web page. So I assume it can be done um, for any information that um, I, I suppose um, that's another a new thing to check for that journal or editorial officers have to convert everything to black text to see if you're adding extra information, trying to hide it as a footnote or add extra keywords. That's a new one. Thank you, whoever uh, added that to the comments. That's interesting. Uh, and here's another one from uh, another attendee. What about excessive self-citation of scientific irrelevant papers? What do you think about that? Yeah, well, that's the same. That's uh, similar to the reviewers trying to promote themselves to increase their citation score, and then authors can do it themselves, and you can do it as the author, author group. You have author cut. Um, citation cartels, um, authors citing themselves, uh, citing another one in um, in return, but the it doesn't really add to the academic argument. And then you can do it as a journal level, and then we see that the um, Clarivate can detect that that journals are citing each other to try to boost their impact factors. So it can be at any level, but again, this is because there's a um, overemphasis on citation scores so whatever whatever is measured ends up being the target and people kind of play the system so yeah um, uh, this is something else to try to detect at submission stage mm -hmm. okay here's one for you we have articles in our journal from 10 years ago um i'm I'm assuming they're asking how far back do you check for sample yeah. articles? <laughs> Is it, do you check 10 years ago or only no, recent or random that's, selection? That's a good, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we do a random selection of, of recent articles. So we won't go <laughs> 10 years back, no. Okay. okay, I think that's what we have time for now. So we've reached the end of the webinar and the Q&A. Thank you for all those questions. I hope we got to most of them. So thanks for joining this webinar. Yeah. And thank you to my co-host, Siri Tussentak. And good luck to those of you who might be applying or reapplying for COPE membership in the months ahead. And you can download the COPE Ethics Toolkit and other resources from the COPE website. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to connecting with you again in future COPE webinars. Goodbye.